I want to welcome everyone, uh, past participants, uh, friends, colleagues, to this week's humanitarian webinar. My name is Brendan Cahill. I am the Executive Director of the Institute of International Humanitarian Affairs at Fordham University. The Institute reports directly to the university's president and acts as a bridge between the humanitarian and the academic communities. And we do so through training of both undergraduate and graduate, through training programs, through our publications and the Refuge Press, through our exhibitions, our lecture series, and our conferences. Uh, I would ask you all to look at our website, www.fordham.edu slash IIHA, for more information about any of those things. Today, it's our great pleasure uh, to welcome Yambo Itankoano uh, to give his lecture on Catholic Medical Mission Board's global response to COVID-19. Yambo is the Technical Director of Programs for Catholic Medical Mission Board, CMMB, a global humanitarian organization with more than 100 years of experience in delivering the best possible health solutions to women, children, and communities living in poverty uh, he will walk CMMB's response to COVID-19 in the five countries where they work, which are Haiti, Kenya, Peru, South Sudan, and Zambia. He'll discuss the progress, the challenges, and what he considers to be the next steps. Yambo is originally from Burkina Faso. He started his career as an educator and a training program coordinator. Over the past 25 years, he's worked with health ministries, international and local NGOs in both Africa and the United States, providing technical assistance on primary healthcare systems, strengthening with particular focus and interest in building community health systems capacity. Since 2017, Yambo has served as the technical director of programs at CMMB, leading the, the technical teams at headquarters and in country offices in the conceptualization, design, development, implementation, and data-driven quality improvement programs globally. It's been a real uh, pleasure and honor to work with CMMB over the years. Uh, and uh, it, that's why today, it, it, I think as we are about to go into or in the midst of a second uh, round of increase in COVID cases, to see really what the challenges are um, uh, throughout the Global South um, and uh, outside of the United States. Yambo, I would turn it over to you. Uh, we'll follow by questions. Uh, so please keep your questions coming. But until then, uh, the next 20 minutes or so will be all yours. Yambo, thank you very much. Brandon, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I must say this is a, uh, for someone who has two little people at home who don't want to hear what I have to say, this is a great morning to have 29 people, adult people want to hear what I have to say. So thank you for joining me. Uh, again, my name is Yombo. Uh, I am the technical director uh, for programs at CMMB. And uh, through this presentation, I just want to kind of hit the following points who we are, where we work, what we do, and exactly what we're doing uh, against, against COVID. Uh, we are a faith-based uh, organization uh, headquartered in New York City, uh, but committed to uh, redressing health inequities for women and children around the world and in some of the most uh, difficult places. Uh, you know, our international volunteer program uh, helps us reach uh, countries and, uh, and, uh, and places with, uh, with medical services, you know, where it is, it is harder to get. Our medical donation is uh, as a further reach. Overall, um, I think my, my, my screen seems frozen, sorry. 
So as Brandon was saying, we are in, in five countries, but through the, 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 the medical donation program, which is one of the legacy program of the organization, we reach a, a lot more organ, uh, countries. Uh, we are physically present in the five countries that Brandon was mentioning in Peru, uh, Haiti, Zambia, Kenya, and South Sudan, where we have offices and, uh, and, uh, and you know, programs. And our programs are focused on, um, you know, two, two main areas in, you know, health system strengthening and, um, you know, capacity, capacity building. So uh, in, uh, in these five countries, we, um, uh, if you go country by country, we have projects uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, we have uh, an HIV uh, program that is supported by the Global Fund uh, and also a malaria program. Um, and then we have a, a maternal, newborn and child health, our MNCH signature program that I will talk, uh, talk more about. Uh, in Zambia, also we have HIV programs. We have uh, SGBV programs. We have um, uh, SDVCA, which is Vulnerable Children and Adults Programming and Nutrition Programming. Uh, in, uh, in Haiti, we have HIV program as well. Uh, we have a primary health care system strengthening uh, through USAID. Uh, and in Peru, we have mainly a maternal, newborn, and child health, along with a GBV uh, program and a community-based rehabilitation program for uh, disability. In South Sudan, we just closed a large HIV program, but you know, starting along with other countries as well, a, an expansion of our, of our MNCH uh, program, the uh, the Champs signature, and we we do also intervene in nutrition, supported by uh, UNICEF and WFP. And so all together in 2019, through these programs, CMMB reached about 1.4 million people uh, just through our programming. And as uh, we're saying, we focus on mothers and children because, you know, as we all know, uh, women are disproportionately uh, affected by uh, poverty, and, uh, and lack of health, uh, uh, health services, access to health services that are the most hit. Uh, if you take uh, on a household basis, most women don't have uh, a means of transport. Uh, per household, most uh, means of transports are concentrated in uh, the hands of men. So they're not, even though they are the primary caregivers, they really don't have the physical ability to, to access uh, services uh, easily. Our uh, MNCH program, uh, the, the signature program that I talked about, which is really aiming at women and children, is done so based on uh, the gaps that we have found in, uh, in, in these countries, in these locations. And this is a result of so many years of you know, global health work, as uh, many of us know. Uh, we have come so far from, uh, you know, between 1990, the 1990s to 2015, and now, you know, stepping on 2015, the results of 2015 uh, into 2030. So these uh, still, so these areas for women and children are still uh, lagging behind. If you take the control of communicable diseases for children, uh, you know, immunization, malaria control, malnutrition, these are still huge gaps and you look at the proportion or the, the part that, uh, uh, the parts of deaths caused by these uh, diseases is still, uh, you know, mind boggling that we still, we, even though we've made progress, these are still areas that we want to, we want to make sure we, um, uh, we, uh, we redress. So uh, through a process, through gaps analysis that CMMB uh, you know, includes in its approach. I know we selected these uh, programmatic areas uh, to, to focus our interventions on uh, so that we can 
uh, make a difference in the lives of children and, uh, and mothers. So we, when you consider the portfolio that I just described, it looks like a disparate, it's a disparate set of projects, but that the end of it, it really is aiming at the, the broader mission of improving the lives of, uh, of women and children. So it is in this context that we at CMMB, we, we looked at COVID when, when the pandemic broke. Uh, yeah, uh, Yamba, yes, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if we just go back to the chance model, uh, and I'm, I'm Luke Doherty, I'm the Director of Communications uh, for CMMB. For, for chance, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the commitment that we make to each one of the communities uh, in terms of the years of service when we go in? Because um, the, really what we're looking for is sustainable change. Um, but we also do not want to be in these communities forever where yeah. education and training is a huge part of what we do. We, we do know that it's a lasting commitment that will bring lasting change, but really it's the handoff and being able to train and educate. So at some point in time, there's a self-sufficiency within these communities. Thanks, Luke. I, I mean, it, you know, there, there is the question, I think someone was, before we started this conversation, someone was uh, referring to the question of how do you sustain uh, global aid and humanitarian aid. So that is a nagging question to all of us uh, who have been in this job and prior for the past you know, 40, 50 years. Uh, so the approach behind CHEMPS is that, you know, you can't change, change doesn't happen at the top only. Change happens at the, the bottom mainly. Most of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the challenges to sustaining gains. You know, it's easy to have uh, uh, resources and pump them into a small location for that period of time and get, uh, you know, and get outcomes. But if the approach is not long-term, it's not going to sustain. So the commitment that CMMB, behind CMMB's approach is that, you know, we go into a community, we make these uh, long-term commitments, you know, we're there, we are going to fix not only the, the health uh, issues, but we are gonna do them in a way that they can sustain. So we're not coming in for two, three, five years. We are there for 15 years at least, 15 to 20 years, uh, to be able to uh, kind of a, take a phase approach to direct service you know, support and uh, health system strengthening, and then a phase uh, system building. So uh, our approach to community healthcare building, for example, it's, it's, it takes an approach to building the capacity of uh, the community leaders and community health community leaders to, uh, to, uh, to drive um, uh, service provision. So right, and Jumbo, if I could also add, it's why it's so important that in our country offices, each of our country offices is actually run by local national residents uh, of the countries um, that we're in. Thanks. And so just a quick glance of, at the, the numbers when you compare between, you know, COVID cases and COVID deaths in our countries against, you know, you take one of the communicable diseases that I was referring to, malaria. And so you can see the striking difference, how many, you know, the burden of disease. Uh, this is not to discount the fact that, you know, COVID was still a threat. So we approach COVID as not just a direct threat to uh, you know, people who get it, but also a direct threat to the services, the mission that we have set, you know, to, to, to we embark on for the longer, well, longer hold, the commitments that we've made uh, with, the, with the community communities. Uh, so we are now, how many months into this pandemic? The numbers speak for themselves, uh, but back, already back, uh, in the early days, um, I think March, mid-March, CMNB was already proactive in, in, its, in its approach. We went full, at the office, we went full uh, remote. I think mid, uh, by mid-March, we were already full um, remote. And then uh, kind of looking at the, um, the, what was at stake in our countries, uh, we started really uh, looking at the broader picture of how do we respond to this, right? And so how we responded to this 
immediately uh, we we at the, within the programs and uh, in the broader organization, it's supporting the country offices and uh, kind of planning and assessing the readiness uh, and and uh, you know making all the plans possible so that not only people are safe, staff is safe, uh, communities are safe, but also we can keep on doing providing the uh, the core work that we are there to do. Uh, there is these business continuity plans kind of took from the office level down to the project level to the activity. How do we make sure that what a community health worker was supposed to do at the household, the, the, the malnutrition assessments that they were supposed to do at the household, how do we keep that going while keeping the healthcare worker safe and the community safe? So we kind of delve into project by project uh, to kind of take a look at what can we do also looking at the, the the lockdowns that were in place, the lo local uh, national guidelines that were in place. And then we went on to, uh, you know, rapidly put together the, the, uh, the, the first sets of training because when it, the pandemic, everybody was, uh, everybody was learning, uh, you know, including here. So we understood the need to, to bring staff up to speed. So we put together all the resources that we could uh, to and, and, and organize rapid training for both facility staff and um, and community health workers and communities. Uh, but then there is, you know, it's uh, once we understood that this is for the long haul, the response should not just be a, a an immediate and and not you know thought for the long. So we 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 decided to 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 have a full on health. Uh, health facility assessment uh, for preparedness because we knew that even though it was coming slowly but it was eventually going to come to to our countries so that we can have a better, a better picture and a better response and this is also can just part of how CMMB does its work within our champs approach we we, we for each champs we have conducted gap, gaps analysis and this is how this is what drives uh, our programming this is what drives our you know, partnerships, et cetera. And so in this, in, in, in that health facility assessment, uh, we uh, looked at uh, about, we looked at exact 253 facilities. This is, uh, a, you know, uh, CHAMP specific and project specific. So donor funded projects as as well as uh, champ so that's a total of 253 and gathering uh, you know uh, up to 8000 healthcare workers it doesn't mean that we you know directly supported uh, in terms of uh, healthcare workers but they were within the catchment that we su we, we we supported so we assess the readiness and preparedness for uh, for uh, across all these uh, in terms of you know, sanitation, hygiene, personal protective equipment, and not just having them, but also how to use them, you know, training the healthcare workers on how to keep patients safe, keep themselves safe, infection prevention control cleaning, et cetera, and, uh, you know, tri triage and isolation uh, capacity in, uh, in the community, at facility, et cetera. Uh, and so- Yambo, can I add one other thing there? Please. Uh, and I think it's the, the foundational work that we have done over the years that have made these assessments so effective for us um, because the relationships that we have, not only with the local and the national governments, but with the community themselves, the foundational work was done um, and that allowed us to make a, a fairly efficient and effective assessment. We were able to move very quickly on it and the other part of it, and I don't know if you want to uh, talk about this at all, Yambo, is that the number of years that we've been in these various communities, um, you know, our staff has helped uh, and has been through pandemics before. And the lessons learned, you know, whether through HIV and AIDS or cholera, Ebola. Uh, so th there have been uh, lessons learned along the way that, that have been applied through all this as well. And if you want to add anything to, to that, Yambo. Right, so I think in terms of uh, pandemic response uh, lessons, I think it was more um, it was more applicable to South Sudan, you know, where 
they, they, they face uh, outbreaks of Ebola uh, frequently. So I think some of the, uh, uh, the screening points, uh, the screening points and protocols and guidelines, uh, also the local teams, I think the, uh, even though it's a very uh, resource poor uh, country, they still have uh, residues of um, the, the, the rapid response teams. They're not, they were not totally, you know, functional or fully in place, but at least there was a, an understanding of these are the structures that we need to rebuild uh, to get it going. And also uh, kind of learning from Ebola, uh, the global community as well, I think WHO kind of put uh, together a set of uh, pillars uh, for the response so that understanding the context of uh, humanitarian, humanitarian work, uh, no one is gonna be able to take on COVID response alone. So it's a set of pillars. Uh, I think it's across 13 pillars and there is a screening, there is a capacity building, there is a PPE. So partners would, would through those uh, frameworks of uh, rapid response teams, they will decide who is better placed uh, based on their experience and capacity uh, to take on which pillar. Uh, thanks, Luke. Uh, this is a snapshot. Uh, the, the, it's a full, uh, thoroughly done uh, health facility assessment with a complete, uh, uh, you know, suite of indicators that we reported on. But this is one example of uh, this assessment, kind of looking at the training for healthcare workers, um and um hold on this is not yes the training of healthcare workers and uh the uh their um uh the proportion number and the proportion of healthcare workers across the the countries obviously we have a lot more in haiti and you're going to ask yourselves why it's in part because of that huge um uh USA, the primary healthcare system uh, system strengthening project up north in Haiti that we are we are we are running. Uh, so you will see, for example, that in a country like South Sudan, where the needs are great, that out of 215 healthcare workers, only one was trained in PPE, and only six were trained overall. Uh, that's just how much it was granted we can say that the cases were still low uh, this uh this assessment was conducted uh between april and may so you can say that yes numbers were still low but in terms of preparedness i think there was just not even in the broader global community there was just not that approach that approach to let's figure out what the problem is and where it is so that we can better uh, confront it. I don't think there was. And CMMB, luckily CMMB was, was kind of able to bring this to, uh, uh, to the table. And so I will respond across the, the five countries kind of uh, cut across uh, a number of, of those, uh, those pillars, uh, whether it's training or wash infrastructure or, or PPE, so it depended on, you know, where the need was, and in that country, what partner, other partners, what we're, 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 we're doing. In uh, Haiti, I think the um, one great example was, for example, for CMMB, uh, uh, supporting uh, the, the 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 setting up of isolation centers and uh, and uh, health um, hand washing stations at the at the hospital. In, uh, in the champs catchment where we are in uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, in addition to just the support, you know, to training community health workers and providing them with PPE and really guiding them through uh, the, uh, the 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 continuity of services, uh, while sometimes the government were asking them to social distance. So there was a moment that they were supported to just do remote. Uh, and um, and sensitizations, but then we were able to pick pick back uh, uh, work. This is a very um, an example of our mail update. I think the the M &E manager is in the in the crowd as well. She could she could add to that. But we we 
frequently kind of share these broadly to just keep everyone uh, up to date on the work that CMMB is doing. And that's um, uh, in for FY20, the third, the third quarter. Uh, you see, for example, about 25, 26,000 individuals were reached just with, with messaging uh, through, uh, through the community health workers. And that was Haiti. In Kenya, uh, again, really uh, focusing on material development, they were able to come up with a, an online uh, training module and that, that will be self-paced. So healthcare workers can actually uh, link to it online and learn it. And uh, in addition to, to um, uh, isolation centers that we built, uh, we, you know, we supported across uh, the facilities. There are about 45 facilities in our Champs um, Kenya, and we supported those uh, facilities with a, with a PPE as well. Uh, a good example of the impact of CMMB uh, in Kenya, uh, just our role, the importance of CMMB in Kitui South overall is beyond COVID. It's, it's you know, talking about the long term, I think we have built all the foundation for, uh, all the foundations for, for a sustainable kind of a long term partnership in, uh, in, Kitui, in Kitui South. We have a wonderful uh, working relationship with um, the county, you know, uh, government and staff, but also a lot of the um, uh, the work that we do is really complemented by um, by by, uh, by the county. In Peru, Peru was one of the countries in our catchment that was the hardest hit. Uh, so unfortunately, we also we actually uh, lost one of our community health workers there, uh, and so the lockdown was, you know longer and, and more severe in, uh, in Peru for our work. Uh, community health workers could only do work uh, remotely. And because of the nature of the programming there, we were, our programming there is more community-based. The CHAMPS, the, the MNCH program uh, is just the, the 1,000 days. So we focus on, uh, on those, uh, uh, you know, on those components because of the the anemia there that is a, a national priority. And so CHWs are very effective at linking mothers to care. And during COVID, I think uh, everything had to be done uh, remotely. Uh, they, they had to become creative and, and, uh, and create WhatsApp groups and include mothers and be reaching mothers through phones. And even trainings and supervision had to be done uh, by, uh, by, by phone and WhatsApp. Um, and so that's why you can see here, uh, more than 3,000 households were reached with, with, uh, with messages remotely and including our targets. So under five kids uh, were able to be picked and referred for care and, uh, and caregivers were able to be trained remotely. Uh, during that time. Uh, in South Sudan, uh, prior to COVID, in the first quarter of, um, of, uh, of uh, 2020, we had already done a lot of wash work uh, because that's also part of our programming there. And so kind of that came in uh, handy, uh, feeding into the hand washing uh, sensitization and great mobilization that was uh, necessary when COVID was just starting, and so um, this was a this was an example of uh, of uh, this. You know, it was an example of this uh, this uh, this work. About twenty five hundred people, you know, were able to have more access to 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 water because. And in Zambia, where you know it's that the, the the country of our countries, Zambia has the least cases, and still to this day, luckily in our catchment, in Mwandi there has been zero case, even though the surrounding kind of close by cities have reported cases. We've been lucky enough to not have any case in our Champs uh, Mwandi catchment, uh, but still we trained community health workers and we provided uh, PPE so that you know. Um, people are safe. And so these are just uh, additional visuals and a 
you know, a, a, a capture of the, 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 the resources that were generated, you know, within the first uh, couple of weeks of uh, this pandemic, uh, you know, rendered through uh, webinars or, uh, or just like a compilation of uh, resources uh, sent to staff. If I can add one more thing, and we talk. I about think that's it. Any questions and compliment, uh, Luke? Well, just I wanted to talk about the mapping survey that the M and E team um, spearheaded, uh, starting about two years ago. That in each one of the communities that we work, we did a household mapping survey um, that allowed us um, to get um, a, a very, very detailed overview of the community, how many people lived in the community, um, how many children under the age of five, how many women were of childbearing years. Um, and that was, that was for our standard, our chance work and our regular service delivery. But it also provided key information for us when COVID hit because we knew where the needs were and the, and the community health workers were so incredibly important to us. And the community health workers are just that, they go into the field, they go into the communities where they know the individuals, they know the families. Um, and, and one of the things that, that unfortunately um, was an obstacle for us was the stigma of having COVID uh, or the possibility of having COVID. So you had a number of people within the community um, that maybe they had symptoms, but they, there was a fear of them going in and getting tested because they didn't know what that would mean, um, being ostracized from their community, people being frightened. Uh, in the beginning uh, of the pandemic, um, people did not even realize that you could recover from it. Um, they, they thought because, you know, if they look back and they remember what happened with HIV and AIDS, um, they thought that COVID was probably and could be a death sentence for them. So the educational and the training part of it um, from the community health workers were critical where we really needed to encourage them to come to the health facilities, come and get tested so you could be properly treated. Um, that, that was just one final thought and, and Yambo, um, I guess, turn it over to you for, for the close. Uh, sure, I mean, that's, um, uh, any, any questions, uh, Brenda? Uh, Thanks, Yambo, uh, and thank you, Luke, uh, for the interjecting. Um, so generally at this point, what we would ask is that you send your questions in to uh, the host, to either Camille or to me, and we'll bring those questions together. I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions first uh, to you, Yambo, and, and possibly to Luke and Alex as well, which is, as a as an aid organization, very often you have to make quick decisions in the middle of uh, a complex emergency, and uh, and yet you have to also plan at the same time uh, for the future. Um, so my my first question to you is is really, what was during this first phase? What was, you know, perhaps the largest stressors uh, there for you, um, and how do you think you will pivot, um, you know, among your five countries to the possible next phase? Does that make sense? Yes, um, I think in the uh, Brandon, if I un understand your question, I think in the early days it was just the there's so much unknown uh, at the time. There was just so much unknown and so much going on at all places. So we were trying to juggle the, the, the situation at the office here in New York, and then un, just not being able to understand uh, and uh, frankly to, to keep track of local, uh, national, uh, guideline. So, for example, in Peru, uh, at the time there was so many change, like fast changing guidelines. First, it was a complete lockdown, and then they say, "Well, we're going to let women go one week, and then what, men go out the other week." You're trying to, you're struggling to understand what is, how do we, how do we 
you know, support kind of trying to keep up with it, with, with that. In, um, in South Sudan, uh, for example, I mean, even though there was lockdown, they were just not, you know, there was no capacity to enforce a lockdown. Markets were going on, churches were going on, just, you know, normal life because people needed to make a living. So I think the, the, that was that was a that was a stressor, if that's what you meant. The, the fact that we couldn't, um, you know, there was not a lo- uh, enough testing capacity. It's not just for us. It's it's just in the, the 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 country. I think the response just had to be educate. And you know, if you're a public uh, health educator like myself, you know that you can only take education so far. You know, in addition to education, you've got to have some of the basic supplies. How do we make sure that a household that hears our message but doesn't have the resources to make a, a hand washing station at home, that we come, we come and meet them there? So that, that, was, that was early on, I felt like that was all part of it. And again, as I was trying to communicate, I think kind of get keeping, keeping the... Um, the focus on other, the the other the other uh, challenges. Yes, COVID was a, a a high risk, but kids were still dying of diarrhea and malaria. And so, how do we balance that when people, when staff is saying, "I don't want to go to the, to work, I I'm sick," kind of either pretending or just not feeling confident. Uh, looking forward, I think we feel like where we are, we are. We, we, this assessment that we just uh, talked about, uh, we are doing a second one to understand where we are at this point. So it's like a redo of that. Uh, and we had planned to do that at the, anyway. It was a baseline and then we're gonna check ourselves and say, where are we right now? And so now that our capacity is better uh, because of the, uh, the training, the, the, the just like continuing education, uh, that we've kept up because of the resources that we added and their protection. We have posed, posed, posed the, um, uh, the, the community health worker and the healthcare uh, workers in a position to take it to the next phase. Um, I was asking a colleague in, um, in Zambia, they are just now going into the summer. So that's different where from where they are kind of looking at the seasonality and, part, and, and, and positioning the community health workers uh, ready. And I think where we have them, uh, this is part of our signature programming anyway, we strengthen the community healthcare system to just be the, uh, the backbone uh, of service delivery in the community. And I think, so I feel like we will be in a position to, uh, to, to support uh, immunization, for example, if we were to come to it. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll hold my uh, second question because um, I want to get to a couple of uh, others in the in the chat, which is, uh, do you see the response to COVID-19 in these five countries as a way to strengthen overall health awareness for these communities? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think actually in Kenya, uh, there was a time, I mean, in, just to pick on Kenya, the, the first couple of weeks of COVID, there was massive response and uptake of uh, messaging at the national, because there was a coordinated national approach. You know, the na- nation was, the guidelines were pretty clear and they were pretty uh, unanimous and coordinated. So there was uh, early on, uh, you know, you would walk in, the, the, in, in Nairobi or anywhere in Kenya, people are wearing masks, people were observant of the behavior. Yeah. So that was that was a, an opportunity to kind of you know add the the sanitation and hygiene behavior change, for example. Uh, but then, you know, unfortunately, in in the case of Kenya, I think some political corruption issues bubbled up, and then the trust they they, they lost the trust. So back to that question, yes, I think it's a it's an opportunity. But then the, 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 it's how to you balance the, uh, the the COVID the COVID focus uh, 
with the, the others, for example. So in, in, in South Sudan, we know that malaria kills, uh, I think 50% of the kids, 50% of the kids who die, it's malaria. And so, but we also know that mothers, pregnant mothers having ma malaria, it's a danger to the pregnancy. And so we tag that, uh, you know, with, through a series of webinars, pregnancy and COVID, birth and COVID. So it's, it's a really an opportunity that we've used in the messaging to say, yes, that is COVID, but just also think of it for the other uh, uh, conditions as well. And have you found, Yambo, that there's increased funding due to COVID or decreased funding uh, due to COVID, you know, for the work that you're doing from your traditional donors? Well, I, maybe, uh, look, you can come in here, but I do think that we, I mean, in our global response, we've been successful. Uh, we've been successful in raising resources for COVID response. Uh, and a number of, a number of, um, you know, funding, uh, funding opportunities have come up tied to system strengthening, but tied to COVID. Uh, but I don't know, look, what do you think? Uh, I think, I mean, and it's an important, it's actually kind of an unfortunate um, way to look at it, but it has raised the awareness level of the overall needs. So in that regard, um, it has helped a bit with our fundraising efforts. And I would say that's probably both in terms of our individual donors, uh, as well as um, corporations and, and foundations as well. But um, the, it, it is COVID, but, but we are trying to expand, you know, the awareness of the, of the overall needs because you know, as Yambo was referring to with um, you know, uh, malaria, malnutrition, um, that these are, these are still ongoing issues and ongoing problems that we need to raise the overall, aware, the overall awareness level on as well, on top of what's going on with COVID. Right. Um, another question in is, uh, what do you think these countries must do to avoid or lessen the, the second phase of the attack of this pandemic? Right, so. Uh, what, a, what a million dollar question. I think, uh, to be honest, I, I, I think uh, one is the, the, the awareness of prevention. Prevention has to be uh, kind of ongoing and, and, and central. Uh, the reason why I say that, it is, is, this is my opinion, is that uh, testing, we can take the approach of test, track, and treat. We can't because we, those countries will not have the resources, the testing capacity to do that. The ideal would have been, let's test and track, just like we do for TB. The reason why you, know, you get a, a TB symptom, you go and test, and then they isolate you and then they treat you so that you know they will test all your families because that is we have the resources to do that in Kenya, South Sudan, Zambia, and the other countries. But for COVID, I don't I don't think that we'll get to that capacity anytime soon. So any strategy that we you know we 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 mold cannot be dependent on our capacity to test. It has to be people need to try to uh, avoid uh, getting the disease. The second, the other part is from the health system side, I think we need to, those countries that were still hesitant about strengthening their community health systems, I think this is another uh, uh, call. Your community health systems, they have to be uh, strengthened. And what does it mean? It means that the language about volunteer community health workers, that doesn't work anymore. You cannot put a, you cannot ask a voluntary person to prevent health, uh, prevent disease uh, in a child, you know, every day or on a routine basis. So I think that has to kind of just move the needle for some of the countries that are still on the fence. I think the evidence is pretty outstanding in terms of how do you, assist, uh, how do you make community health workers effective? But some countries are still there. So for, luckily for the countries where we are, 
um, I think there are policies, but they are not completely uh, implemented. So Zambia is an example. Where we are intervening, we have actually become a, mod a model for the, the government itself. They just came up with a, a mob vac or vac mob, something like a vac mobile vac vaccination. And they only realized in, in, in out of 113, 117 districts, the district where we are, because we have the, strength, the strongest community health system, they, had, they chose that district to pilot because you can't pilot it anywhere else because community health systems are not functioning. And so I hope that Zambia kind of turn, learns from that and says, we are going to move from this MAG system, which is you know, safe motherhood action groups. They are voluntary community health worker cadre that are not effective. Yombo, um, you know, in a year ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation by Zoom. And, uh, and so the, the opportunities that, that have arisen, you know, they're, they're sort of the opportunities that have arisen out of this sort of new way of working um, has allowed us to reach a different audience. Um, through adaption of, of online uh, online webinars, et cetera. Uh, there are always lessons learned and opportunities that, that arise in new ways of working. Would you, would you or could you point to some of CMMB's uh, sort of new ways of working that have arisen out of your response to the COVID-19 or over the last six months in general? Yes, you know, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, it's a great point. I mean, I can point to my own team. I think one of them is among the, uh, uh, the participants. I think we, we all kind of fumble early on. How do we, how do we you know, keep going? I, luckily, the nature of you know, global health uh, technical support, the, the kind that we do, I think most of the time you can do it remotely this is what we do anyway but I think for the uh, for the office here it the f first few weeks were 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 you know a little bit challenging so uh, we were able to uh, to, to create with the, the, the situation and say how this is how we're going to work going forward let's set up an online um, a tracking platform where we can just you know put our weekly plans and weekly actions and track where we have issues and ask for support where we need. And I think it has worked well. I don't think we would have kind of thought about that if we had the offices ready and we were there all the time. And I think uh, the idea of uh, training a supervisor in the field in, uh, in how to support their community health worker or the health worker at the hospital uh, remotely would have been thought this is not going to work. We have conducted training remotely, uh, especially uh, building up and or drawing up on our volunteer program. We have leveraged their technical knowledge and asked them to come and, and support continuing medical education online remotely so i think that is uh, i mean it's just kind of a make you want to the, 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 the what we used to think of building capacity and large crowds and, and training groups i think we have broken that down to we can simplify the content and then transfer that online uh, my colleague here julia she has conducted a lot of um m and &E, uh, monitoring and evaluation training to uh, staff in the field through uh, YouTube videos. I mean, this is not something that we would have done. When COVID hit, she was herself caught in South Sudan. She had to cut the trip and come back. But I was just looking at the series of YouTube that now the team can go and, and access. m and &E is another component that CMMB has, you know, made as a signature, we want to strengthen it because without data, you can't make right decisions. Right. 
Well, I think, uh, let me just see if we have, uh, we have room for one more, uh, which is, um, have, have you seen any incidence indicators related to countries with high TB immunization uptake and COVID incidence rates? Hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't, um, I don't know. I have not, uh, maybe because I haven't paid attention, but it's something interesting. Anybody, I know, uh, I, I would be curious actually uh, looking at it. Um, most of the work that we do on TB, we don't have, uh, we don't have programs that directly support TB at the facility. Mm -hmm. So the cross-cutting systems that we have in the community through the community of workers is the, uh, the, the, the link there. And in some cases we have debated whether or not the density of our intervention is sufficient to collect data. So let's say we are supporting community health workers in, in, uh, in Haiti and they are checking danger signs, uh, tuberculosis danger signs at the household level. Should we burden our uh, m and &E system to track uh, that indicator? Because we don't provide medicine. We don't train healthcare workers at the facility to treat those TB cases. But back to your question, I think it's an, it's an interesting question. I do not know. Well, I'll, I think we'll leave it there. I, I'm, I'm so grateful to Yumbo and to Luke and to the CMMB team to talk frankly and honestly about uh, the, you know, the struggles, um, the work that is being done by their, by their teams and by obviously by headquarters yeah. in response to these five countries. Um, Yambo, I would turn it over to you and to look for, you know, sort of brief final word. I can only just say thank you to you all for uh, sitting through these uh, past 40 minutes to listen to me. I'm going to share the recording with my kids and say, look, l listen, there are people who listen to me. So uh, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Camille, for organizing. Thank you, Luke and uh, Alex for, uh, for making this happen. I have I've enjoyed them. I, um, I think um, I look forward to, uh, to more. Thank you so much.